Yes, yes, yes. We are back on the podcast here up in the blue seats. We had a nice little all-star break, a little week to reset, get our mindset back fresh, just like the Rangers did, except for Igor and Trochi and, you know, the head coach Laos over in Toronto, which was where Molly was and where Larry was. Brian was busy as well, too. Guys, I'm so glad to see everybody back on here. I feel like the mood in Rangerland has been subsided a little bit by the three-game win streak. The ship's kind of feels like it's been turned the right way. So we'll be discussing that. We'll be discussing uh, a little bit of a goalie controversy that we have here. Yeah, that's that's going to be the big topic today. And uh, I know Molly has plenty to say, as does Brian and Larry. Uh, so we'll get into it. Of course, Molly Walker, the Rangers beat writer, Larry Brooks, New York Post legend, and Brian Boyle, pretty, pretty great Ranger hockey player, too. So, um, folks, uh, just because we didn't speak at all last week, how was, everybody, how was everybody's break? Uh, Molly, Larry, I know you both were in Toronto. Brian, what did you do on the break last week? Keep you busy with the kids? No breaks for me. No there's breaks, no, no. There's no breaks. All gas. All gas over here. <laughs> had a lot of things to do. Had a, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I actually had to jump through hoops to get something with 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 uh, onboarding. I talk, I've talked about it on this podcast, haven't I? I had to do the onboarding for for the post to be on this podcast, all this real world world stuff that I never did. The team just took care of it. Uh, it's really getting, it's really getting to me now. I've uh, never really grown up and uh, welcome. <laughs> it's no, I don't want to come here. I hate this place. <clears throat> but yeah, everything's been good. Um, you know, we got a couple of weeks left in the hockey season for the eight year olds and it's getting a little crazy chaotic. We can get into that later with some, mm -hmm sort of trial season coming up and nervous parents. But uh, other than that, everything's been real good. Kids are, kids are healthy, knock on wood. And everybody's been looking forward to a little, little sunshine coming up here soon too. Mm. Listen, I think everybody is at this point. Plus, it's only Phil saw his uh, shadow or didn't see a shadow. That means spring's coming out, oh, whatever the hell that means. I don't know. But <laughs> uh, glad to hear everything's well with you. Uh, Molly, Larry, how was Toronto? Um, plenty going on out there. Um, do you guys have a favorite moment over the weekend? Toronto was really fun. Um, I think my favorite thing was was watching Trocek enjoy it with his son. He's not not usually an emotional guy, and, and even still, like he he didn't really show that much emotion. But in so as someone who talks to him on a daily basis, you could just tell how much the whole weekend meant to him, and that was really a cool thing to see for him and his family for sure. Yeah, it was a good weekend. Um, I, I thought the NHL uh, put on a pretty good event. It was pretty, you know, it was entertaining. It, uh, you know, you you look at it for what it is. It's it's a it's a break in the in this in the season where guys get together, they show off their skills. I thought it was it was um, rather competitive for again for what it was. It was pretty competitive, and uh, um, I enjoyed I enjoyed most of the uh, skills competition. I thought. You know, the the one on one was a fantastic event. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. obstacle, the obstacle course to finish it up was was, you know, guys were taking it really seriously and for a million dollars. I would, too. For a million dollars. <laughs> so I thought it was, it was a good weekend. You know, I, I had a good time. I think Molly had a good time. So mm -hmm. that's what we like to hear. Yeah, no, it, it, it was entertaining. It was one of the things that I kept thinking back to what Ryan said on the pod a few weeks ago, where, you know, guys aren't just going to the all Star games, just, you know, skate around and, you know, just put on a you know, Jersey it's it's it there is some pride in, in that game and I think you saw that especially in that that final showdown where um, it was kind of appropriate where you had Igor and Trochi versus Lavs um, which I I love the New York connection there which is a lot mm. of fun so well, you know you know what too over the weekend and and this is, is has has been a constant with the league the the faces of the league had a, had a lot of responsibility over over the weekend um, mm. and I mean you know Connor McDavid Austin Matthews and they responded and uh, mm -hmm. you know the league has always asked a lot of its top players the top players are always the guys who carry it um and for the most part you know the the league's top players have been outstanding ambassadors for the sport um, um and you know this weekend i thought was was an example of the same thing 
It's uh, it, it's important because I mean, yeah, it's it's an all star game. It's it's mainly for the hockey fans, but it is a great way to put the sport and the league uh, on full display for a lot of people that you know may not necessarily know certain star players. So to your point, yeah, that makes a ton of sense, and it's um, it's great to see these players giving back in that sense. So, uh, but let's get into the Rangers now. Um, like I mentioned earlier, to start uh, on a three game win streak. Um, you know the the. The, the sirens that were going off, people jumping off the ledges about the Rangers uh, not being good. I think um, everything has calmed down a little bit, especially after the win last night, 3-1 to one against the Lightning. Uh, but there was a certain person in goal for the third straight game, uh, and that is none other than the future Hall of Famer, Jonathan Quick. Um, we talked about this early on in the podcast when Quickie kind of started off the season looking really, really well, that there shouldn't be a goalie controversy. Uh, Igor Shosturkin should be the goalie, you know, the 1A, if you will. Um, but now there seems to be some talk because Quick has looked rather good in the past three games, especially. And, um, you know, Molly and I were talking before the podcast about who would be starting on Friday because there's word that Igor has been working with Benny um, just on some, some stuff. But is it a foregone conclusion that Igor is still the 1A goalie, Brian? Is is he He's still the guy, right? You remember him getting pulled in the first round of the playoffs a couple of years ago, twice? <laughs> you know, these things happen. It's uh, never, it's really hard to be really, really, really consistent, especially in net at this level. Igor's still their goalie. Johnny Quick has been unbelievable. He probably will get more games. He should get more games, but you want Igor to figure it out. Um, everyone's saying if it's game one of the playoffs tomorrow, well, it isn't. And, these things happen and their game as a whole has been, has taken some dips as well. Um, I could have played goalie last night, I think for a while and got that win. <laughs> That's a fair assessment. Wow. <laughs> and they were great. They were great in front of him. And if you can continue to tighten that up, he'll get his confidence back. He'll see the pucks that he's supposed to see. And I I'm not, I, I, I hate these conversations. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. And it's not, they have to be had. I get it. Um, it's noise for the team. It's noise for Igor. And he needs to understand that he's an NHL goalie in a big market. So you have to deal with that noise. And it's a, in a lot of ways, it's kind of a little disrespectful to Jonathan quick too, who's got some hardware and yeah. obviously still ability, maybe can't play 65 games, but can play really well. And he's, he's proved that over, I think a large enough sample size this year. So it's a great thing to have two really good goalies that can win you games. One's going through it a little bit right now, maybe mentally or uh, physically with just some of his mechanics or fundamentals. And you work that out throughout the year. You have the luxury of a guy who's getting your wins. Yeah, I go back to, as as I cited after uh, in my column after the Tampa game, um, I go back to December of 2016 where Hank – was was kind of you know he was he was playing okay he had kind of leveled off after a after a really fast start and Anthony Ranta was the backup and and Ranta had done a terrific job he you know he it was a seamless transition from Cam Talbot to Anthony Ranta I mean, they never had to worry about who was who who was playing for them and so Ranta plays one you know he goes in one game and they win two to one then they go back to back. And they play him the next night, too, which was, you know, kind of took everybody by surprise. Oh, Hank was sitting two games in a row. Unheard of. Then he gets a shutout. Mm -hmm. Then Ranta gets a shutout, a one nothing shutout in, in an overtime game in Chicago. So he plays the third straight game. <laughs> well, there's an uproar about Lundquist. <laughs> and, you know, Hank is, is out there and he's trying to he's trying to answer questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and he and he turns in his second straight shutout. So now he's playing the fourth straight game. And this is it was unprecedented. It was the first time in Hank's career that he had been a backup for four straight games. First time ever. However, there was not there was not a question about who was their number one goalie. It was going to be Lundquist. It was Lundquist. And, you know, the natural order was restored in game five. And and Ranta, you know, played as a backup. And Hank played six out of eight games. This is what's going to happen with Shesterkin and Quick, assuming that Shesterkin can find his game. 
if he doesn't find his game, the Rangers have a major problem. You know, the, Jonathan Quick has been great. Um, I was thinking driving home last night, you know, if he were 32, this would be different. But if he were 32, he wouldn't be on the Rangers as a backup playing for $800,000 a year. Right, so, right, exactly. he, he, you know, he'd be the number one playing 68 games and winning the Vezina. So mm. it's hard for 38 goalie, if 38 year old goalies to play a lot. Very, very few have played even 40 games over the last eight years. So one of the reasons that Quick, one of the reasons that Quick might be playing so well is the way they've scheduled him, is the way they've used him too. It's like in you know in baseball, when a guy is hitting 350 as a platoon hitter, and they say, oh, he should play every day. Well, not you know not really. Mm -hmm. The reason he's hitting 350 is because he's being used in a role. So I just think that this is this is great for the Rangers. It's a luxury for the Rangers that they that quick has given them the time for Shesterkin to work on his game yep. with many and they and and you know so they have a fallback i doubt that he'll play in, in chicago on friday but if he does he does you know because again the rangers it, it's about getting points mm -hmm. the rangers have kind of you know re um reestablished this cushion as far as the playoffs are concerned um, so I, you know, they're, they're in a, in a good spot. I think, um, as long as Shesterkin can find his game, it'll, it'll be fine. Molly has a lot to say. I have yeah. so many, I just have so many thoughts. I don't even know where to start to be <laughs> quite honest list. with you. I, I, I don't though. So like, I'm worried that my thoughts are just going to come out as like a jumbled mess and like, it's not going to make sense or, you know, everybody's going to think I'm making such a big deal over, you know, something that shouldn't be made a big deal about. And let me be clear. There is nothing there is no big deal to be made of anything yet, but the yet is what is kind of worrying me just because it, I think it has a potential to be a situation that could become a distraction for the Rangers. If, and only if like everybody has mentioned, Igor Shesterkin doesn't get his game back, which it, it's still it's still a possibility. I mean, I think there's no question he plays on Friday if the Rangers want, you know, to you know make decisions that stand behind everything they've done and said to shield their goaltenders from an impending goalie controversy. Peter Laviolette comes right out and said it twice. Igor Shosturkin is still our guy. Um, but I do think that reading between the lines of things that were said that day before the Lightning game, it was the tentative plan is what Laviolette said. And that tells me that they had to give the net back to Jonathan Quick after Monday night's game. He won that game for them. He played outstanding. He was lights out. And I don't think that the Rangers win that game without Jonathan Quick. I don't think they won that game if Igor Shesterkin was in net, to be honest. So I just, I think that I don't even, I don't even know how to put my thoughts into, into words, but I just think that there is a potential for it to become a distraction if Igor Shesterkin does not pick up his game, because to your point, Brian, you know, about how this is kind of a little bit disrespectful to Jonathan Quick. I agree with that. I think Jonathan Quick, he's not just some Joe Schmo. He is who he is. He's an a proven, established veteran. And correct me if I'm wrong, you know, all this talk about him being 38, I, you know, I don't disagree with it, but he had a starter's workload in LA up until he was traded last season. Am I wrong? Like he had 30 games in LA, yeah. right? Yeah. Before he went to Vegas and he had 10. So I'm not over here saying, you know, times have changed. The goaltender, you know, workloads have changed. I'm not over here saying that if this does happen, Jonathan Quick should be ridden toward the end of the season. Absolutely not. But I don't think it's a question of whether Jonathan Quick can handle a more of a starter's workload or a tandem workload. Um, I don't think, I just don't think, I mean, of course we haven't seen it in the, for the Rangers, but I don't think it would be fair to say he couldn't unless, until he does. So I think that Jonathan Quick has earned the net and unless Igor Shesterkin shows that he can take it back, 
the Rangers could have a lot of tough decisions on their hands. And I think it'll be super interesting and super telling how they handle and navigate the situation if that does happen, because the last thing the Rangers want to do is sour the relationship with Igor Shosturkin, which is a possibility. And Igor had a very interesting quote as well. He said, I trust them and they trust me. And that's me. That The way I took that was Igor is saying they better not screw me over in this situation. So, I mean, that's just how I took the whole situation. Nothing, you know, there's no panic alarm bells to be hit just yet. But I just think that we might be uh, closer to a situation than people might think or people might want to let on is just what I'm what where I'm coming from I think (laughs) really quick just to keep in mind um quickie has a you know he's in the east now and the travel's better that's helpful to a 38 year old Mm -hmm. having played a higher workload in the last you know four years even the numbers aren't what they were you know the prior 12 or 10 10 years for Jonathan quick obviously whatever he wasn't on a great team in in Mm -hmm in LA for some of those years towards the end. But if you play well and you earn the net, what is the, what is the conversation? Like if Igor wants the net back, play better. Like get enough of this uh, with the, with the, the comments is self-deprecating, like play better. Like you're a big part of this team. You, you didn't have as good a year last year as you did the year before where you were all world. Find the game. It's, it's the NHL. Like the best players are going to play. You want, the ceiling's obviously higher on a younger, you know, athletic goalie that's done it in the past. But Jonathan Quick is really, really athletic. So we're looking at his age, and I'm looking at his workload, and it goes, you know, the numbers go like this. They go straight down when the workload goes up. I get it. But And you don't want to lose that. you got lightning in a bottle with him right now. He hasn't played this well in a number of years. So you don't want to have him go out there, overuse him, and have him get shelled. Then, you're, then you have a different problem. But. If Igor's worried about Jonathan Quick or he's worried about what, whatever it is, just focus on your game and play better. That's all. It, I mean, that's how it's yeah. going to work itself out because you don't I get this that, good yeah. by accident. I doubt that Igor is, is worried about about Jonathan Quick. And, and uh, you know, the, the Rangers, yes, w- will it become an issue if Igor doesn't play well and Quick continues to play well? Yes, but it would be an issue if Igor weren't playing well regardless. Right. Because, <laughs> You know, they they built their team on on the foundation of, of strong security, goaltending, of, yeah. of strong goaltending, and that's Shesterkin. Um Look, I uh, watching Jonathan Quick play this year has, has you know, has, oh, just has, what a treat! Uh, it's been Love a treat it. um, because uh, not only has he has he played to this level, but he's an, so entertaining to uh, watch. Uh, you know, his yeah, style. Really? Yes, he's just it's so, so different. And I'm not sure how he does. I'm not sure how he's in position to make the second save. I, you know, I. It's you know, the athleticism. He's, he's, he's a freak. All of <laughs> yeah, he's, he's all a famer. But um, you know, I, I watch him. I just don't quite get. You know, get the way he approaches his. Uh, um, you know, the, the technical aspect of the game for him. But um, okay, look, he's he's just been um, a revelation. He, he has, and you know, you think back. I would laugh at myself at how concerned everyone was because of his training camp. Right. Which, it, wasn't know, good. it wasn't good. Oh, was no. Not good. And mm-hmm. it was kind of like, wow, <laughs> you, know, you know, he's Jonathan Quick, but, you know, come on, you got to stop the puck. It's also, you know, it's hard. It's hard for me to draw a comparison to Henrik Lundqvist and the anti Ronta situation because I just feel like, Henrik is Henrik. I don't, I don't, I don't equate Igor and Henrik just yet. So, you you know, like that's also, that's the other layer to it. Uh, Yes. He's been their number one goalie for the past four seasons, but in this instance, the Rangers need to do what's best for the team. Mm -hmm. If that requires giving Jonathan quick more starts, then that's what they have to do. And they can't, like at, they do have to worry about, you know, the way Igor feels about it and keeping the relationship good and, and an open line of communication and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, the Rangers need to do what's best for the Rangers. And if that means giving the net to Jonathan Quick more, then that's what they're going to have to do. And that's just how it's going to be. But 
I mean, this is all, I think a lot of this talk is hypothetical, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying like the conversation could really pick up if Igor goes out in Chicago and lays an egg, which, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. So it's just, it's, it's there. I just feel like it's there. The situation is there. So it's, it's just something to monitor, which is, you know, kind of what I've said. So you're something to monitor. Yeah. <laughs> finishes this year it's kind of an up and down year you know you would have thought they'd try to extend them mm -hmm. yeah. yeah all the time now what do you do yeah it's good it's, it's a very it, this is not a one year left a, yeah this is not a good time for for igor to have uh, uh a down year it's not no but it's then it's like if, if you're if you're chris drury and he's and yeah. then he goes out next year and he sets the world on fire the first 40 games and he's in the, he's a UFA goalie, mm -hmm. so it's it's this is tricky. Yeah, <clears throat> this is why I'm on a podcast and I'm not a GM. <laughs> you know what I would do there. Well, that'll be a discussion for another day because I think I love being is... on the podcast. Sorry, I love oh, no, no, of course, yeah, absolutely, yeah. No we know Brian, on. we know. <laughs> no, I mean, I I I do eventually want to have the conversation later on in the season about. Um, you know what a possible uh, uh contract extension could look like for Igor because there's there's been some discussion where it's how much should you be dedicating of your cap salary to a goalie and and is it necessary for a team to win a Stanley Cup to have um, a high market value goalie in that sense but again another day we can discuss that uh luckily for Igor though uh if he does do well against Chicago uh the rest of the schedule for the next three games looks pretty decent because you have Chicago you have Calgary and then you have Montreal um all three teams which aren't great hockey team so in theory it should be able to give him a nice landing place uh bearing that he's able to have that first good one on on friday uh if he is in it so we'll he uh, will we'll, be he will, he will be, be. Mm. He, there's just no way he's not a, i just i would be mm. stunned i would be so stunned i really would molly putting a lot on the line here in that <laughs> statement i'm sure if uh I'm 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 hoping for your case, knowing our listeners and and our commenters. Yeah. That, hey, I that... mean, I would, but that would be that would be it would feeding be. into the other narrative, which is be. which is what they which everything that Laviolette said and everything that Igor said, you know, that would go directly against it. There is no reason why Igor Shosturkin should not be in that against You're Chicago. Right. There's just no reason. You're absolutely right, and I, I it's much needed for this team, quite frankly. Yeah. Uh, before we get to our subtext questions, uh, one of the things that happened, actually, is pretty much directly right after we recorded two weeks ago. Philip Hedel, uh, yeah, he, um, it's 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 unfortunate. He's he's he worked his his way back. We saw his whole um, you know, training, uh, being documented, working with um with Yager, and then coming back to the team, and then having uh, what sounded like a very very scary situation, um, during you know practice and whatnot uh brian i guess you know obviously he, he's not gonna be back the rest of the year um and molly i know is one of the things that you mentioned early on uh when the injury first happened about you know whether he'll ever come back as a player uh brian as a former player where you again you went through some some health stuff as well too where i'm sure at some point in time you weren't sure if you would get back uh to playing hockey at a professional level you know what could possibly be going through hedel's mind as of right now with his status in limbo Ah, uh, yeah, it's it's really hard because it's a part of you. Like no one makes it to this level if it's not a part of you, right? Like people want to play and people have to play, and the guys that make it are the ones that have to play. That's you know, I think that's what separates the skill level is pretty similar. The you know enjoyment of the game is pretty similar. Like you you do a lot of things. You lose friendships. You you know, have to lean on your family. You, a lot of different things have to happen for you to make it uh, because that's your goal and you'll do anything to get there. So when it's taken from you or potentially could be taken from you, it's a part of you that's gone. And even when you retire, it's almost like the death of a close friend. I, I can speak to that having gone through it. It's like that's over now and it's it's never going to come back. So this the threat of it being gone is one thing now. You have a life to live and you can be a productive person and help others or do whatever you can after playing is over, no matter what. And every athlete needs to realize that even while they're playing, because it, it, it it's no one plays until they're 65 collecting social security it just doesn't happen. <laughs> and, you know, Tom Brady tried it and he was awesome. 
the goat, uh, but it, you know, it doesn't happen and you have a long life after it. You got to be careful here that it, I don't know what happened. I didn't see what happened from what it sounds like. It was non-contact and it was pretty innocent or whatever. I mean, I've seen it with kids that I came up playing with high draft picks, a lot in front of them, bad concussions, spiral down into a really dark place for a number of years. So you need to, hopefully the support is around him, finds a purpose if he can't play, but doing the right things, not risking something even more traumatic or whatever if if he thinks that that's the only thing he can do is play hockey. It really has to be about him. And they're saying that. They're saying it's about the overall health of the human being, and that's that's what they're doing uh, as an organization, which I commend. And what he needs to understand once he's seeing and thinking clearly, um, keep in mind, like, I don't know how many listeners or you guys have had concussions. It's, it's a really weird thing when the thing that's telling you something is wrong has something wrong with it. So you, you just can't really almost trust yourself and you really have to be as honest as you can. And when everything's right and back to normal, you'll know it. And sometimes you try to trick yourself into knowing it and, and you're wrong. And I've gone through that a little bit. And fortunately for me, there's, uh, you know, I'm fine, but it, it's like, it is, I mean, I'm telling you, it's scary and you got to take it very, very, very seriously and almost proceed with an abundance of caution from here on out. Well, we'll see. Uh, obviously, you know, he, he, he was an, an important piece that the Rangers were hoping to get back before the deadline, at least to kind of help assess what they need. And now that he's out, I'm sure the Rangers have other plans to figure out how to replace him moving forward. But um, all right. We appreciate it. As always, thanks, Larry, for coming on. We're going to get to our mailbag questions coming up next on the podcast. Back on the podcast here, and it's time to take a dive into the Post Sports Plus mailbag. Yeah, you sent these questions to Molly. Molly sent them to us, and now we're going to answer them for you and hopefully give you some good answers and um, not confuse some people, which I think the last mailbag <laughs> did. But again, we're not going to acknowledge that. Uh, let's start off the mailbag here <laughs> brian loves the mailbag segment by the way uh <laughs> molly mail molly mailbag as larry says <laughs> uh this one comes from anthony labella how would the rangers conceivably split up Kreider and mika would you do it if you were the coach why or why not brian you want to go first you want me to go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, take it away brian yeah coach will do whatever he can if it's not working you split him up you, you have a really good thing going you know, with Trocek and Panarin. Um, and you got Mika and Krides, and then you kind of sort of mix and match. Like we've always done, or we always did pairs, like those two guys. If you're, if you're mixing up lines, you keep two guys that really work well together. I played a lot of games with Brandon Prust because him and I worked well together. Um, you can mix and match anything. And then one year we didn't play together because we weren't playing well together. These things happen. It's not you know, you're not married to line combinations and defensive pairings. If it's not working or even if it's stale or if it's like, let's see if we can get something out of somebody else to bring him up with Mika or, you know, bring Chris to down a, a line to see how effective he can be. It's different options that you're weighing and looking at to seeing if, if you can one, get a spark if you need it Two, how it would look if you needed to make a change in a playoff series where it's just not working. The matchups are the same. Uh, three, like, what are we going to do when we go on the road and we don't have the last change? How do we change our lineup a little bit to make their coach think? There's so many things that go on. And to have a little bit of familiarity with other players as opposed to just playing with the same guys all the time, it, there's pluses and minuses to it, but it's it's obviously everybody's seen it on every single team. That's why it's done, in my opinion. Something that I've gathered just from you know talking to Peter Laviolette and and seeing the decisions that he's made and how he's moved throughout the season and in particular during a really rough January um I think that he does value continuity a lot especially taking into consideration um what this Rangers team dealt with the last two years changing lines every day almost it felt like every day every day coming to practice it was a big deal to watch the lines because every day the lines 
felt like they were different. And by the end, the players were openly talking about how difficult it was and, and they were, they, it, they came across almost annoyed at it. So I do think that continuity is something that, that LaViolette is valuing, but exactly to Brian's point, I feel the exact same way. If it's not working and it's getting stale and something needs to happen, he will make that decision and will do so. And I think that there have been a few occasions in game in particular, but only a few. He's only done it a couple, two, three times maybe where he's really put the lineup in a blender to try to get something going. But it's something that he only pulls out when he feels like he really, really has to because I think he is trying to be sensitive to the fact of what this Rangers team went to went through in the last two years. Um, I think, you know, something a lot of people have said, and I've, you know, I agree with it. It would be kind of cool to see Mika and Trocek switch, but Laviolette and rightfully so has, you know, ridden that Trocek, Panera and Lafreniere line. They have been the most consistent unit for them. So I think that he, that it would be a last resort to split that lineup because he really does like those three together and what they've done for a majority of the season once Philip Hedl went down, but it's definitely, you know, it's always going to be an option. I don't think Lavi Lavi like came in day one and said that he wasn't married to anything, but that being said, he did go back to what Gerard Gallant did to what, you know, David Quinn did with the deep pairs and, you know, the top six um, because that, you know, it, has worked in the past and it I do think it's a comfort thing too especially for players like Chris Kreider and Mika's manager they've been together for years so um I do think that continuity is valued but not he's not married to it 100% Something to keep an eye on Lavs knows what's best you gotta trust the coach at this point uh let's take this one from Kerry DeMarco would you say a third line center is the most important need yeah I, I would, especially like we just mentioned with the with the news about Philip Hedl. It definitely is. I know that two big guns are off the table, but I don't think that the Rangers wanted to overpay for either one of those guys. And it seems like that's what would have had to have happened. Um, so that's, I think, a, a, a reflection on Drury, you know, to have restraint, not to not to overpay for those guys, especially, you know, with the precious little cap space that they have. Um, but definitely a center or two uh, should be, especially if, if Larry's report is, you know, accurate, which it almost always is um, that they do want, you know, they are going to go all in. They are going to do what they need to do to really bulk up before, before the trade deadline. Yeah. Is that a center who can, has offensive ability and can play a hard and structured game is you're going to call him a third line center. I get it. It adds depth to the team. Mm. They're not cheap. Um, no. like a solid five defenseman who's really heavy can play 18 minutes and just punish. Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. um, the scoring winger that everyone tries to go out and get all the time. I think there's enough offense there. If it, can be had at a certain price, you know, you, what's realistic. And if you can add, I've said, you know, there's a guy in Washington, you could add, there's a guy in, um, I think Philly, you can add, he's not necessarily center, but there's guys there that I don't know if they're going to trade with you in Metro. I don't want to throw around names and make trades on a podcast, but <laughs> any kind of, any kind of energy element, any kind of personality element that always kind of galvanizes the team. Sometimes they can be had for cheap. There's going to be a lot of talks a month from now during the trade deadline about how these big moves are going to help teams. And then there's going to be no talks about some guys that are really, really going to help their team. So you got to trust that process with Chris Drury and what he's doing, what he's willing to give up, adding but not mortgaging the entire future. Mm -hmm. And they're in a really good spot. Uh, so I, it's not going to take much, I don't think. I mean, coming out of the East, there's a couple – there's a couple heavy hitters in the Atlantic. Um, and Carolina looks to be getting better after a terrible start. But yeah. I think the talent level and the commitment to what they're trying to do here has been really, really good. I like Lavi as a coach. They don't need to overspend to get a little bit better. 
And that's where you got to trust what Chris Jury does pretty well, which she did pretty well last year as well, too. So mm -hmm. uh, we got a couple more here. Let's do this one from Jeff Garrigan. Uh, Zach Jones seems to be fitting in nicely in his limited opportunities. Do you think they are satisfied with him and Gus as a 6-7 D-man? Or do they have to look to add perhaps a physical presence on the blue line? I do think that, especially where Zach Jones is concerned, and I'll let I'll let Brian touch on Gustafson, but in terms of Zach Jones, I know Larry asked Laviolette uh, before the Colorado game, I think it was, um, if he was tempted to put Connor Mackey in because Mackey obviously had a really good game against the Senators, drops the gloves with Brady Kachuk, which, by the way, so awesome to see. I mean, that guy took two flights to, to Ottawa from Cleveland after playing a game with the Hartford Wolfpack the night before he got up at 5.45 a.m., <laughs> came in he, it, the way he described his day was so funny too. came in grabbed a meal pre-game nap you know then he was taking warm-ups and he it's still at that point wasn't sure that he was going to play and ryan lingren lingren was a late scratch and then suddenly he's suddenly he's playing and suddenly he's dropping the gloves with brady kachuk and jump starting a crazy rally for the rangers so it was a fair question 100 percent. but la violette and turned it around and said well the guy who's been here all season playing in this seven playing in the seventh defenseman role was also pretty great in Zach Jones. And it's true. Zach Jones also had a great game. I mean, the look on his face when he tapped in that that pass from Artemi Panarin, what a cool moment for him. I'm sure that was. Um, but yeah, I think Zach Jones has definitely held his own. And if anything, even if he's not a long-term option for the Rangers, if anything, he has definitely upped his trade value in, in the limited time and limited appearances that he's had this season. Yeah. If you're a team that has guys that are in your selling and you want to bring in youth, that's what every, every organization who's sort of rebuilding or retooling or knows that they're not in a playoff position. That's what they do. They, trade older guys with bigger contracts and they bring in draft picks and youth and, you know, prospects and, and guys on the cheaper assets, but also cap space in general is a huge asset. So if you can move a, a Gustafson who has that offensive upside, who can help run a power play. So your Connor Bedard or whatever can get more touches or whoever these young players are in Arizona. It doesn't like these guys have value in the league that might be more valuable to another team where you, and you make that trade. That's, that's what happens in pro sports. Now we're, again, we're not trying to move anyone out. They've, they've had some injury and they've done, I think, well in their roles and long-term, are they worth keeping or is it better to move on? Or is it more fair to them to move them on? Nobody wants to get moved during the season. You want to stick it out with the guys you've grinded this long, but, I mean, other cases are different, but you know, in in this aspect, yeah, they they have options, and it starts pretty much with their cap hits and their usage, and their talent level. They're they're both very talented. Given bigger roles, who knows? But you got to earn those roles too. So it's mm -hmm. it's uh, you know, Zach's a young young. He's still a young player, and, and he's a defenseman, which is very hard to adapt in this league. So you, it's a tough one. You don't want to give away something too soon. Uh, Gustafson's shown that he had a down year. It's kind of hurt him contractually. He hasn't made a ton of money, but it's that's a good spot for the Rangers to be in. We can keep him for cheap, or some teams are going to covet this eight hundred grand on his cap hit. And I think mm -hmm. he has another year, right? No, I think it was a one year deal. It was a one year deal. Oh, yeah, sorry. shows what I know. But it's what either way, he slides right in. There's no issue. Oh, was... well, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the Gus bus. Uh, mm -hmm. He's I it's like the depth and the offensive ability. If you've had injuries, yeah. and, you know, God forbid anything happens to any power play defenseman. Yeah. He he's he's just, those are hard to replace too. So. I just think the Rangers are in the same pit position that they've been the last, you know, since since their run to the Eastern Conference final where mm -hmm. they're not looking to subtract right. unless yeah. they're immediately, you know, replacing you know like right. unless they're it's a one-for-one one type deal you know or or you know mm -hmm. ensuring that they are plugging it immediately because that's why you know all this talk about you know trading capo caco well mm -hmm. coming back in needs to be somebody that's going to right. replace that immediately so that's you know i think that sometimes gets lost in translation that the rangers are not in a position to be subtracting right now if you're moving caco 
this guy has to be a huge upgrade now. Exactly. Right? Because exactly. Of, because of where he is in his career and what his salary is and all that. So that's and and what he does for the like you know right. you can you we can you know talk about and you know very interestingly Capo has kind of fallen off on the PK rotation mm-hmm. and he didn't play in the final you know six plus minutes last night actually. And, you know, one could go as far to say he's losing Laviolette's trust a little bit, maybe. Um, but that being said, that doesn't diminish, you know, the minutes that he does play and the defensive, you know, contributions that he has and what he does with his puck possession and things like that, um, that the Rangers would need to replace, that they would need, it It would have to be either a direct replacement or, or an upgrade. Mm-hmm. Rangers aren't in the business of subtracting guys and getting better for future years. They're trying to get better right now. So any deals, you always got to keep that in mind. Uh, we're going to do one more quick one before we get out of here. And this one is strictly for you, uh, Boiler. Um, this is from Michael Dox. Um, oh, yeah. Question on your thoughts about Jim Ramsey and the effect that his departure has had on the team. Do you have any fun Rammer stories from your playing days? Oh, I mean, Rammer just loves the game and loved being a, you know, being a part of the New York Rangers. And I, 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 yeah, I do have a funny one. He, we had a skate, like a family skate out in Central Park and we had a dinner after Mr. Dolan would put this thing on and really, really generous. There was like hundreds of people there from the, the whole, everyone that was employed on the Rangers side and their families invited. And so Rammer goes out and you know, his son was young and his daughter was young. They're younger at the time and they're they're out skating around. His wife, Anita, skating around. And he's starting to do impressions on how guys skate. <laughs> and he, he's a really high energy guy. So much fun, which you need during a long, long season. But he, he gets to me and he starts doing this like big lumbering <laughs> skate. And everyone's laughing. I'm just shaking my head <laughs> because he went a little longer on mine and he kept doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and he falls ass over tea kettle, bangs his elbow, probably smacks his head, skates off the ice, and I'm still just shaking my head at him. The boys are howling. <laughs> and he looks at me and goes, I probably deserved that. Go, he definitely <laughs> deserved that. Aww. Uh, tons of fun. You know, no, no surprise. He got a another job right away. But yeah, he was uh he's the man. I I, I love Rammer. He's a he actually, and funny thing is. You know, he played the game and lived the game and loves the game. And he taught me a lot about being a young player coming into that league and what it meant to be a good pro as a young player and how to develop, you know, more of an understanding on what it, what it means to be a teammate. And he was great with that. And he was blunt with it, too. Sometimes it wasn't always the greatest thing, but that was uh, I was thankful for that. That's the stuff I love hearing about because all the fans know you guys. Uh, they know, you know, head coach whatnot but it's 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 the behind the scenes guys that that i feel are uh you know the unsung heroes as well too to get you guys through that long season so uh best of luck to rammer obviously was with the, the team since 94 um so you know he was doing something right i guess uh all right well thanks for those questions everybody uh, i'm sure there'll be another mailbag in the future be sure to sign up for post sports plus so you can get your questions in on the next episode uh we're gonna close things out next but first here's your boiling point for the week now it's time for the boiling point. Brian, what's boiling your point this week? Uh, I had to think about it a little bit, which is a good thing. Uh, but number one is the Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi at my house is so bad. And I've been on the phone so many times. And the people on the phone are very helpful. But it's the things we're doing to try and get this. I've, I've spent money buying. They've sold me on these nodes that I'm just killing myself with and my family with the radiation probably that's going through my house and it just it works for a day and it doesn't work anymore so someone's playing a trick on me i think or oh, wi-fi is terrible and it's making me crazy i'm in my basement again i have to i had to get up and move my setup down here again because this is where the mothership is she's behind that wall over there and that's the only place it works now when the internet does work and I'm trying to read it up on things that are going around the league or whatever. And I'm going on the internet starting, I mean, always, but it's just going to ramp up from now until the election, the political stupidness of people and the arguments. Don't argue. Don't argue with anyone online. Just don't do it. Don't be a clown. 
the, 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 the tug of war that these people are just, I mean, they're, they're celebrities now. It just drives me crazy. Nobody's doing anything to help anybody. And it's all this, and I can't get to my information that I need and it's all polluting my feeds and stuff. And I'm not smart enough to figure out how to weed it out. It just pops up there. Invasion of privacy and Wi-Fi. Anyways, that's all I got. And that'll put a bow on episode 143 of Up in the Blue Seats, our Rangers podcast from the New York Post. Before we get out of here, we got to dish out some stars. Uh, Molly, ladies first this week, who you got? I got to go with Jonathan Quick. Mm. Just three straight starts. First time he's had three starts in a row since November of last season when he went four in a row with LA. So, you know, hasn't had this opportunity in a bit here, and I'm sure it's super rejuvenating for him. And he has risen to the challenge, to say the least. That's, I mean, the whole episode is pretty bit, pretty much been about <laughs> Quickie. Uh, so I, I, I can't doubt that. Also worth noting, uh, 756 NHL starts, a third most starts all time. I think he's among... at 57 now. Oh, 57, 57 right, 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 yeah, yeah. right. So, so now he he has the third most starts all time for American born goalies. That's pretty damn impressive. Brian, who's your number two star? I got Leo Trocheck doing the <laughs> yes! lacrosse goal at the yeah. All Star game. Hell yeah, that was so epic. <laughs> oh, what who, a cutie! Who's, who's dethroning that? No one. <laughs> Honestly, I feel bad now having to put like a, a, a third star after the thing. Should have gone second. <laughs> yeah. gone second. <laughs> you know, mistake. I kept on that these. one close to the vest, too. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> you didn't that let any of us know. Molly's all excited it. shotgun quick. I'm giving <laughs> you other guys. I had this thing <laughs> since I You were ready. This. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dialed. Well, to, to try to follow up that one, I'm going to take as my third star. Uh, easy peasy, Jimmy VZ. Another. Uh, another goal last night. Actually, had the uh, the empty netter as well. Two, three goals in the last six games. Um, you know, definitely a favorite on the podcast here. Just easy to root for. Um, love what he's done with the club. He's certainly brought it back in terms of um, you know, just just he's an affordable player. He's has an impact on this team. You could tell that there is uh some leadership quality in, among him as well too. So, Jimmy VZ is my third star. Well. Well, uh, we'll say goodbye here. Um, as always, we're going to thank Jake Brown. Jake, happy birthday. It was the Podfather's birthday uh, this past yeah. weekend. So the uh, big 33 for him. Larry Legend. Larry Legend. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Patrick Ewing, a garden legend as well, too. Who, uh, 33 for Rangers. Do we, do, do, do anybody? Michael have... Roosevelt. Wow, <laughs> that's a pull. That is a pull right there. That's so 30, impressive, Brad. He, he might have been 32. Was he 33? 32. Shoot. Oh, oh, he was 33. Did, he was did 30. you ruin it? <laughs> So much confidence there. Oh, wait, one more thing before we do say goodbye that we didn't hit on at all because it happened after last week's. Uh, I need thoughts on the stadium series jerseys quickly. Go. Oh, I don't know. I, no. I, they're, I feel like you either, I don't know. They're fine. They're, I, fine. they're, they're fine. They're okay. Um, to be fair, I like the devils a little bit more. Devils, or, devils is clean. The devils, devils, clean. Are, devils are really nice. Uh, the well, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> the islanders are hideous sorry Terrible. flyers flyers didn't do anything different and no. honestly the rain at least the rangers did something different um but i think i'm just so biased because i love the lady liberty and every time oh, the lady liberty gets back, snubbed back I'm upset. to lady liberty i know but that's just me and every you know that's no <laughs> surprise to anybody so you know they're good they're good i uh, they're fine they've grown yeah, on me I mean, a little they're bit. all one concept right they all have yeah. to play right. off each other and they're big numbers and big Mm-hmm. Is it far away? You're at a football stadium watching hockey. They look, oh. It looks like an old, the Rangers one looks like an old starter jacket. Yeah. Which I love the starter jackets. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up with starter jackets and they were, they were the absolute noise. If you had a starter jacket, you were, you were a beauty. Star- <laughs> and starter, I feel like is like back to coming back around again, just like uh, members only jackets. I know that's, that's also coming back too. So, mm-hmm. um, Michael Roosevelt was 33. Uh, Boom. Dave Carpa, Mark Savard, Bruce Driver. So, yeah. They're- oh, Savard. Yeah, so one. so you know we 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 have some some thirty three pull yeah the uh the stadium jerseys I like them they they they've grown on me but I'm not dropping the two eighty on the authentic <laughs> sweater it's just not... they were flying off the shelves apparently at the uh, garden the last couple of games so. I'm sure they were I saw a bunch of people like wearing them on the um uh, the L A R on the way home so uh, mm. people must like them which is good but I I like your theory about the numbers being big because you're playing in a state that, that's mm-hmm. I, I didn't think about that I I kind of dig it so. 
Uh, plenty of more sweater talk coming up on the podcast, I'm sure. Uh, all right. So you can catch up on all episodes of the podcast by subscribing to Up in the Blue Seats on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. If you're watching this right now on the New York Post Sports YouTube page, give us a thumbs up. Comment below. Should the Rangers continue letting Quick start over Igor? Oh, that'll spark some good debate, I'm sure. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter. That's at Molly Walker with two E's, two R's, at Brybrows22, and myself at Andrew Hartz without the E. For Brian Boyle, Molly Walker, Larry Brooks, I'm Andrew Hartz. Thanks, as always, for listening to the podcast. We'll talk to you next week. Later.